Good morning. My name is Tim McGarthy. I'm the Executive Director of the Worcester Regional Research Bureau. Thank you for coming out. It looks like uh, we have the stalwarts in the group uh, for an issue with such far-reaching impact and, and uh, real uh, energy around it, both locally and at the state. Um, you know, our goal is to help inform the debate, inform the discussion. Uh, and I'm very pleased that we have a great group of panelists here and a moderator to talk about this issue. Uh, it's one that will have far-reaching impacts on the Commonwealth. Um, the, the Research Bureau got engaged on this issue uh, not because we typically focus on state policy and state, state questions, but because the city engaged on the issue. Uh, the Worcester City Council went on record voting to support the idea of a $15 minimum wage. And so our goal and our mission is to, as I mentioned, help inform public policy. So we looked into what is the minimum wage, what does it mean, and where does it go from here? What are the, what's the debate about what the minimum wage should be? Uh, and in our efforts to kind of uncover what is the solution, we recognize, as you all I'm sure recognize, it is a complicated issue. Uh, the minimum wage applies universally across the state, whether Boston, Worcester, Springfield, or Williamstown. And therefore, the question of its impact uh, references really the locality and the market it's within, not just the overall look at Massachusetts and Massachusetts needs. And so in our report, we looked at the history, uh, we looked at what the minimum wage has, how it's been implemented in the past, and we put out some considerations going forward, whether or not the state should look at the minimum wage from an economic point of view, bring together a policy uh, group of experts, uh, and whether it should be localized, recognizing the administrative and potential economic challenges of doing a localized minimum wage, but also recognizing the real impact, disparate impact, that a minimum wage could have on various communities. Um, I do want to thank my panelists who are here. Uh, we have Ramon Borja Mendez from Clark University. We have uh, the Honorable Dan Donahue, state representative from Worcester and the lead sponsor of the $15 minimum wage legislation that the state is looking at. Uh, and Stuart Loosemore, uh, the Worcester Regional Chamber of Commerce's lead on government and policy questions. Um, we're also pleased to have Jeremy Thompson from the Mass Budget and Policy Center to give us an overview of the issue based on their research. Uh, Mass Budget and Policy has been a leader in the minimum wage discussion in Massachusetts, and Jeremy's work has informed much of our work as we look to explore the issues. Uh, I do want to recognize our sponsors. Um, the Research Bureau could not do this work without the support of the community, uh, whether it's the philanthropic community or the business community. Our lead sponsor today is Commerce Bank, a division of Berkshire Bank. And I want to thank Commerce, uh, as Commerce has gone through its own transition over the past year, it has remained a stalwart friend of the Research Bureau, allowing us to do this type of work. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeremy. Okay. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming very early. I took the train out here from Boston. And thanks to our panelists. So a little bit about Mass Budget. We're an independent, nonpartisan uh, think tank focused on uh, tax budget and public policy issues, uh, specifically that affect uh, low and middle income uh, workers and their families. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the $15 minimum wage, the proposal to increase the minimum wage to $15 in Massachusetts, and we'll also look a little bit about what the effects on Worcester are going to be. Um, and then uh, we'll turn it over to the panelists um, to hold forth on a couple issues, and then we'll have a discussion in the Q&A. So the uh, minimum wage, uh, the push to uh, raise the minimum wage to $15 is part of a national movement called the Fight for 15. Back in November of 2012, uh, fast food workers in New York City went on strike. Uh, kind of formally kicking off a national um, movement involving uh, similar actions in cities all over the country and uh, policy campaigns to raise state and local minimum wages to $15 an hour. And there's been success in New York State, California, the District of Columbia, and a number of localities. Um, as Tim mentioned, there are administrative challenges for localities in Massachusetts to raise 
their own minimum wages, uh, specifically, they're not allowed to do it because the state sets one minimum wage. If cities want to do it, they have to ask permission of the state, and that's um, quite a process, as I'm sure folks can imagine. So uh, why do we need uh, to set minimum wages? There's a number of reasons, but one of them is the link between economic growth, um, or rather the decoupling, I should say, between economic growth in recent years and wages. So productivity, which is how much we turn out as an economy per hour, um, generally goes up, uh, which means um, there's more uh, economic surplus or profit uh, for private companies. And because it's the workers who help generate that profit, the idea is that uh, they will see an increase in their wages as productivity goes up. And in the post-war years, in fact, that is what we saw. Increases in productivity tracked increases in hourly wages. So since the early 70s, due to a number of reasons that um, I'm sure some folks are familiar with, um, that has led to this pattern, which is called the great decoupling. So productivity has continued to go up, economic output has continued to go up, but those increases have not uh, returned to workers' patients. So what if the Massachusetts minimum wage had kept up with, with productivity? So right now the state minimum wage is $11. Uh, that was the last three increases from eight to nine and then 10 and then 11 in 2015, 16, and 17. There was no increase into 2018, so the minimum wage remains $11. So if minimum wages had kept up with productivity, we would see a minimum wage of about 18 bucks an hour. If it had kept up with CEO pay, the minimum wage would be $120 an hour. <laughs> this is the pattern that we've seen for wages, not just at the lowest end, but really um, at all levels. As we can see, since the late 70s, which is the earliest year for which we have a consistent set of data from the federal government, um, wages went up for the lowest 10% of workers, I'm sorry, wages went up uh, for the highest 10% of workers, the 90th percentile, and for the median, that's the typical worker. But the very low end, they went up a little bit in the mid-80s, and then since then, pretty much stagnated. And you can even see, since the recession, wages for just about everyone have stagnated, except for uh, earners at the very, very, very top, which are not shown on this graph. Productivity, as you can see, went up pretty steadily from the late 70s until the recession. Since then, it too has been uh, just about flat. And so there's a big debate out there about what can we do to increase productivity, um, although that alone, as we see, is not going to drive wage increases without some kind of policy. So I want to zoom in on uh, the period from 1993 to 2016, and actually we have data for 2017, for the lowest 10% of workers, right? So the 10 percentile is the wage at which 10% uh, of workers earn at or below. So what we see is that since 1993, the yellow line shows the 10 percentile wage in Massachusetts. The blue bars show when the state increased the minimum wage statutorily. Essentially what we're seeing here is that left to the market alone, minimum wages, the 10 percentile wage rather, sorry, goes down. So for the lowest wage workers, the market isn't doing uh, what, it, what it might be able to do in other circumstances uh, to raise wages. And so the state comes in and introduces statutory minimum wage increases in 96 and 97, 2000, 2001, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see that those statutory minimum wage increases are the only things that lead to increases in the 10 percentile wage. The market, it's a, the economists call it a market failure. The market's not doing it so uh, statute has. Even at $11 an hour, a Massachusetts minimum wage worker would only have earned $22,880 in 2017. That's based on a 40-hour work week, 52 weeks a year. So as the report lays out, and as we're going to hear from Representative Donahue, uh, there are um, uh, two vehicles right now to increase the minimum wage in Massachusetts. One is a piece of legislation that originated as legislation this session. The other one is a ballot initiative that was put forth by the Raise Up Massachusetts Coalition, um, which, because the Attorney General certified the signatures collected to support that ballot initiative, has also now become a piece of legislation. So there's two parallel bills now that could increase the minimum wage. Um, if they were to both pass, as we can hear, hear from the representative, there would be a, a bit of chaos, perhaps. So I think the thinking, uh, certainly for the purpose of this presentation and maybe for our discussion, is to focus on just one. 
in this case, the, the ballot initiative. Because um, with one more round of signature gathering this summer, if it comes to that, it will be on the ballot in November. So the basics of the ballot is that it would increase the minimum wage from 11 now to $15 an hour. It'll go to 12 in 2019, and then 13, 14, and finally 15 by 2022. For tipped workers, there would be a sub-minimum wage of 60%, so $9 an hour by 2022. And the idea there is that whatever is not made up for in tips, the employers would have to then make up to bring it up to 15, as is the case now with tip wages. Importantly, it would also be adjusted to the cost of living index, so we don't need to keep having these campaigns and these fights every several years. Um, basically, as the cost of living goes up, so would the standard of living. So just a, we have a pretty small crowd, this shouldn't be too, too difficult. What percentage of um, minimum wage workers, or rather, sorry, what percentage of the people who would benefit from an increase in the minimum wage in Massachusetts are adults, meaning 20 and over, one person? Yeah? Um, Probably about 30 percent. Anyone else? 3 percent. Okay, three. Uh, what percent are parents? How much? 12%. Well, you've seen this presentation before. You? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, how about uh, working full time? And what percent are women? 2% of people who benefit from an increase in the minimum wage are women. So it's actually like this 90% of the people who benefit from an increase in the minimum wage are adults, 20 and over. Yeah. About a quarter have children, and over half work full-time. So I say this because I think in some people's minds the um, teenage seasonal worker is kind of a typical minimum wage worker, but it's actually not. <clears throat> and women, as you can see, constitute more than half of the workers who would benefit from an increase in the minimum wage. And just to be clear about what terms we're talking about, and the, the Bureau's report also mentions this, when you think about who would benefit from an increase in the minimum wage, we think about kind of two categories of people, those who are directly affected and those who are indirectly affected. So the directly affected people, pretty obvious, is anyone earning below what the new minimum wage would be. So if you're earning below $12 an hour and the minimum wage goes to 12 January 1st, 2019, you are directly impacted because of the law says you have to be, whether you're tipped or not. The indirectly affected folks are those who are making just over the new minimum wage because the idea is that employers want to avoid wage, want to avoid wage compression. So let's say you're a frontline supervisor in a restaurant or a store, and you're making like twelve fifty an hour now. If the people you're supervising go from eleven to twelve, right, you're probably going to ask for a bump as well, and your employer's going to want to want to give you that bump. So they'll also see an increase. So basically, we say anyone earning fifteen percent above the new minimum wage will see an increase as well to avoid those those wage compression effects. It's not just the lowest income workers who would benefit. This shows workers up to, in households making up to $75,000 a year. And you can see that even those households making between fifty dollars and $75,000 a year, among workers in those households, 36% would see an increase. So fully over a third of middle class households, depending on how you define middle class, would see an increase. And you can see the dark blue are the directly affected folks I talked about, and the light blue are the indirectly affected folks I talked about. In Worcester and in Central Mass, a larger share than statewide would see a, uh, an increase in their pay from moving the minimum wage to $15 an hour. In Worcester City, fully 41%, we estimate, 41% of workers would see an increase in pay from an increase in the minimum wage. In the rest of Central Mass, it's 30% uh, and collectively it's a third, whereas statewide it's 29%. So what would the impact be of $15 an hour in Massachusetts? Well, for families, it's fairly obvious. It would raise their standard of living quite significantly. For businesses, it would reduce turnover and training costs, and it would lead to higher productivity and morale. People like making more money. They're happier when they make more money. They're less stressed when they make more money. They don't need to work as many jobs. They can maybe work fewer hours at the job they have if they so choose, and if the employer that works out with the employer and spend more time with their family have more leisure time, kind of all of these things will just lead to happier and more productive workers. Obviously, there could be some increase in costs. We've seen um, some small, but they're, they're there, um, effects in cost increases 
particularly in restaurants. However, because the workers who would benefit from this increase are those who are most likely to spend most or all of their money and not save or invest or do otherwise with it or spend on luxury goods, those folks would put the money directly back into the economy and most low wage industries have pretty small trade areas. So a work, Worcester worker who sees a big increase in the minimum wage is gonna spend that money at restaurants and stores in greater Worcester, thus potentially making up for uh, the impact of increased costs. Uh, finally, I wanna mention the Seattle study. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Seattle study. Okay. So what the Seattle, and it's mentioned in the report, what the Seattle study claims to have found were job losses from increases in the Seattle minimum wage from 9.47 to $11 in 2015, and then from $11 to 13 in 2016. Now there are some problems with this study, which the report also mentions some of them. So the first problem is that the findings are pretty far out of range from most published research, right? In any kind of science, including social science, you kind of want to check the range of your findings that most other researchers have found. And in the paper by Hardim and others, they acknowledge that their findings are um, pretty large. <clears throat> One thing that they cite is that the increase in the Seattle minimum wage was also large, and therefore it's not uh, out of line for their findings to be large. However, they call the Seattle minimum wage increase large when they compare it with national uh, minimum wage, uh, national minimum wages. But in fact, relative to the Seattle labor market, the Seattle minimum wage was actually, was actually within range of, um, of Seattle wages in the labor market. And so the findings also should have been in range, and that they weren't. Um, should have raised, uh, raised eyebrows. The other problem is that it's not really representative of Seattle's actual labor market. Um, does anyone here own a business? How many uh, locations do you have? Uh, we have, in the, in the city here, we have three locations. Okay, and how many do you have outside the city? Uh, just here. Okay, so you would not have been included in the Seattle study because they excluded every single employer that had multi-site locations just because of the way the data set that they got from the Washington uh, Labor Department was given to them, they had to cut out 40% of all Seattle workers, <clears throat> um, including all chain, chain employers. And then finally, it, it doesn't really account for kind of a booming Seattle labor market, right? I mean, it's just tricky to measure the effect of minimum wage increases in booming labor markets because <coughs> the wages are going up anyway. And so they do this kind of weird thing where they attribute um, an increase in employment above $19 an hour to a decrease in employment um, around the minimum wage of 13, which doesn't really kind of make sense from an economic theory standpoint. It's like the labor market is saying, well, we can't afford to pay our workers $13 an hour, but um, we'll pay them $19 instead. It doesn't really, doesn't really jive. Um, and also, as I said before, when we look at direct and indirect impacts, we try to keep the indirect impacts to within 15% of what the new minimum wage is going to be. The Seattle study kind of considers all affected workers um, to be those who earn up to $19 an hour. And at that point, you're really looking at two different labor markets. I would argue that $19 might be a low wage worker because they make $38,000 a year, and that's not a lot of money to get by in a place like Seattle or even a place like Worcester. But for the purpose of looking at minimum wage increases, it's, it's a bit too high. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there because you might hear about it, it's in the report, and so uh, that'll contextualize things for us. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions for me or if we can just turn it over to the... Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. So um, that's all I have. Uh, we'll hear from our panelists and then um, we'll have a little bit of discussion. Thanks. just the employment effect when you raise the minimum wage. So we can be talking mostly about the employment effect, but there are other substitution effects which are very important to consider, given the fact that you know, labor markets are not monolithic entities. That means there are segments within the labor market, so when employers um, see that there is an increase in, in, in the minimum wage, they find a variety of ways to you know, accommodate and dissipate that effect. And that's what the research solves. I mean, the, the catastrophic effects of you know, 
force of workers would, would be laid off as a result of increasing the minimum wage. They have never materialized in 50 years of history of minimum wage legislation. It just simply doesn't happen. Um, now, you would have to then break it down by type of industry to understand within the industry effect. You have to also break it down across industry effects. And you have to also understand it uh, within the context of multi-entity you know, firm effects, which also speaks to the variety of norms that also interact with minimum wage. So it's not such a simple that you, know, you increase the bar and then there is this direct one-to-one -one effect that results in the, in the layoff of thousands of workers. It just doesn't happen that way. I think the debates are heavily ideologized and, and, and sort of obviously, you know, most employers would may not want to see you know, the, the payroll, um, cost of payroll increase, but, you know, I always have to remind people that the strategy which made Henry Ford famous was paying workers the maximum feasible possible wage and setting the value higher you know, in the context of seeking productivity gains. So, um, so I, I think it's important to break down the debate in some contexts in cities where there are highly concentrated, saturated markets within particular sectors such as restaurants. Uh, there are very short-term effects in terms of layoff, but accumulation happens shortly after. And so, you know, again, you know, these these are also um, jobs that, um, by de facto, are designed to be high turnover. And um, and as a result, the effect of the minimum wage gets dissolved with high turnover, and over time, employers are able also to make gains in productivity, accumulate, you know. Redeployment of, of, of other forms of you know savings. Uh, we've seen increasingly also, um, especially in the last kind of round of um, in the upswing in in sort of in the in, in the labor market by as a result of the last um, tax break that employers are going to you know just not necessarily increasing wages for other workers but. Um, increasing bonuses, so they're transferring gains in different in different ways. So I think, you know, I, I think that the, the basic point is there is no such a thing as a catastrophic employment effect. We we've never seen it. When we review the literature from the 60s, uh, methodologically, you know, in the 60s, in the data we had available during the 60s, basically concluded that there was no big employment and the only substitution effect was within the youth labor market. The 70s and 80s saw a completely turnaround in the research with newer sets of data and increases in computational capacity, whereby then we started saying, well, there is an employment effect, uh, but we can identify more substitution effects as a result. Substitution meaning labor for labor, labor for capital or technology. And then uh, the 90s were pretty silent in terms of, 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 of that debate. And uh, in the sort of subsequent decades, what we've seen is three trends indicating that sometimes there are benefits, sometimes it's neutral, sometimes there are no benefits. Mm -hmm. But that has to be qualified uh, depending on what kinds of workers, men, women, youth, when you say adults, now we are considering adults, people 25 plus, but the effect tends to be concentrated between 16 and 25. So there's a lot of slicing and dicing that we would need to do in order to localize the effect of raising the minimum wage. Overall, however, um, there is a, you know, a, a general good effect with respect to you know, workers who do not have that long-term prospect at you know, seeing a lot of wage growth over the lifetime, which is that it leaves a floor for everybody. And I think this is kind of like, you know, the, the basic point, you know. There is a section of the population, of the you know, wage earning population, that as Jeremy pointed out, have not seen any increases in the last, you know, 35, 40 years, even though their productivity has been increasing. Right? We can tell that because also education 
our education per worker has been increasing, right? So, um, so I think it's 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 a um, it's a way of you know, creating a basic, higher, solid, more, better floor for workers. It is also, um, in a way, you know, forcing you know employers to say, okay, so if we, wages are going to be up, what are we going to do in order to continue improving the productivity of workers? You know, so it raises concern about not just simply taking the low road for every feasible solution you may want to sort of put in place when you're working with human resource management. And I think that as a whole is, um, you know, I think, um, I think of um, you know, Kenneth Galbraith in the affluent society way back in the 50s, you know, after the early 1950s recession, he said, well, you know, it makes, it makes good sense to, to have a society that is feeling fine with regard to how it's managing its human resources. And um, if, you know, it's, it's a good thing for all when we can see that the capacity that people have to earn a living um, and, and decently and working is kind of one of the fundamental components of, of, the, of a social contract, right? And, and I think that's, it's a matter of, of fairness, it's a matter of how um, we think about equity in society. Um, I wish we could set up you know, minimum wage to, to you know, executive compensation. As a matter of fact, um, you know, the, there's a couple of cities who've started to you know, uh, do some, some of those some of those things. And I think it's just, you know, it depends on where you stand in the, you know, in the spectrum of what you think is a is, a, is an adequate and an equitable social welfare or social um, distribution welfare function in, in, in society. So count me on that side. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Representative Dan Dunningu, it's uh, thanks for coming in so early, and thanks Tim and uh, the staff and research group for putting this on, and Jeremy for your, your great presentation and for, uh, for your, your kind words from academia. Um, I, uh, I think when it comes to the minimum wage, the, the basic idea behind why I got involved is that I think that our economy and our commonwealth, our communities work best when everybody in in society is able to make ends meet. Um, when I meet up with constituents uh, in my district, in particular across the state. You hear from people who work in two, three, even four jobs just to make to make ends meet, to pay for basic costs like housing, shelter, food. Uh, you have people that are still still qualify for SNAP benefits or for other state funded uh, programming. Um, I think it's unacceptable that if you're working 40 hours a week, if you're working full time, um, that you should be able to make a wage that allows you to provide for yourself or for a family um, in, a, in a meaningful way. Um, and I think that by giving back. Uh, for, getting those wages, you're best able to kind of solidify uh, yourself in your community, and I think it benefits um, society uh, as, as a whole. Um, as you saw on the board, we, we've raised minimum wage, and I was happy to support it uh, uh, a couple of years ago when I first came into the house uh, to raise it. You know, it was first it was a fight for $12 an hour, but we were able to move forward and, and got an $11 compromise. Um, and now that we've seen the, the $11 wage, and we're talking as you saw in the presentation, you know, we're still making under $23,000 a year. Um, we divide that out looking at housing costs uh, across the state. Uh, we've seen figures where you know the average two-bedroom apartment, you have to work 94 hours a week on minimum wage, $11 an hour, for the average two-bedroom apartment in the Commonwealth. Um, and how do we make sure that people, you know, if they're working full-time, if they're going out and they're fully employed, they should be able to, to, to afford those basic needs. So, um, as Jerry mentioned, I, I filed um, uh, my bill initially in the beginning of the session. Uh, we had over 74 co-sponsors from, uh, from the House and from the Senate. Uh, which is a tremendously large number of people that have, give, have given their initial uh, sign-off um, on the idea of, of moving forward uh, with increasing the, the, of the wage to, to $15 an hour. And as Jeremy said, that has been that was filed, honestly, in anticipation of a ballot question that is coming down the, the pike, which was uh, now with the collective, uh, with the amount of signatures uh, has been refiled as a bill. Uh, I'm, I'll stick to kind of talking about the ballot question, but just, just to, for kind of edification, the really only difference between my bill, uh, which pushes for an increase to $15 an hour, and the ballot question is really just the change in the tip minimum wage piece. Uh, my bill pushes for you know over four years, $1 an hour raise to $15 an hour, and then paying it to the consumer price index. Uh, but we had looked at initially uh, work, working towards abolishing tip minimum wage over eight years, which would be following the, the lead of eight other states that have done so. Uh, most recently, Maine uh, and California uh, have done so. So it's going to be a, a slow, protracted way to kind of bring tip minimum wage in line with 
a basic minimum wage, and that's uh, obviously has changed to just being an eight, a 60% increase in the ballot question. Um, and you know, I think we, we filed this bill, and the background behind the timelines was, you know, with the $11 an hour minimum wage, that that $1 stepped increase over a year, and it's both predictable. I think it's pragmatic. Um, and I think the most important part that we missed in the last time that we raised the minimum wage was pegging it to the consumer price index. Um, pegging it to the CPI, I think, is, is a huge point because, as we know, in Massachusetts, only the legislature and the, the, the general court can raise the minimum wage. And what we've seen is time and time over again, either long delays in between the raising of the minimum wage or we see these dramatic increases of a dollar a year or these planned uh, increases instead of, <clears throat> or a ballot question that might that might come through instead of having a peg to a long-term strategy that it will change with you know as prices increase the minimum wage will increase and have a more of a long-term stability to it and not oh my god this year we're gonna go up a whole nother dollar or two dollars to allow businesses to, to kind of uh, come around on that on that issue um, so far in the, in the legislative session um, you know we've, we've seen quite a bit of support I think I think a lot of it is because you know having just done the first minimum wage increase um, Massachusetts since we've gone to eleven dollars an hour We've seen 150,000 jobs added, and we have the lowest unemployment rate that we've seen since 2000. Um, and I think a lot of that's given into the idea that increasing minimum wage and putting more money in more people's pockets is going to generate economic activity. Um, you know, we're talking 41 percent of people in Worcester are going to be affected by this. That's 41 percent of, of the population that's going to have an extra couple of dollars to get the pizza on a Friday night, to go to the, the restaurant down the street, to buy that extra set of clothes, to, to maybe get a better apartment. Whatever the cost may be, I think you see that ancillary benefit, and it, and it drives um, drives the economy forward. And then across the state, the number is just just under a million people would be affected by by a minimum wage increase. Which, again, looking at the numbers that we've seen um, from the last increase, um, I think is, is is a net positive benefit uh, for the economy in the long run. Um, that being said, we everyone in the legislature understands you know the the idea that they increase costs for businesses, um, and one of the things that reason I filed legislation was to make sure that there's a legislative solution to this problem. Um, we, there is a ballot question, as we know, and they, so basically the timeline on that is they've collected the first round of signatures, which is certified by the Attorney General, Secretary of State. Um, they then have the option, if we do not take action on their version of the bill, uh, we then, they then have, by the end of June, um, through May and June, they can collect the second round of signatures, uh, which they fully intend to do. And if by the end of June we have not passed a piece of legislation, then that ballot question will appear on on the on the November ballot um, as it is and as it's written. I think we've all seen over the last couple of years um, quite a few ballot questions go through and quite a few flawed laws go through. I mean, most most currently marijuana. Um, we've had you know the, this, this uh, very stringent uh, earned sick time pass on the ballot. Um, and I, I think what the role of the legislature should do is, is really to make sure that we're, we're bringing everybody together to have a real conversation about how to do this correctly. Uh, it's how $11 got to the table. Uh, when $11 was negotiated, it, it was originally a fight for 12 It had CPI in it, and obviously those negotiations changed to whatever the economic climate was and the conversations that, that we had. Um, and I think that <laughs> right now it's, it's contingent upon the, the House and the Senate to, to really come together which, to, to have that conversation on where, where can we figure out what's best for for our businesses, for our small businesses, but what's also important for the economy and for low-wage workers across the state. So those conversations are ongoing right now, and uh, unfortunately, we're, we're on a deadline, so it's only a couple couple months to, to really get to a fix. But you know, I'm, I'm confident that you know the legislature can work together to find a solution that that will benefit everyone on a whole. Rep, you got to stop reading my talking points on uh, ballot questions. I love <laughs> <stuff. laughs> I think half of my uh, ballot question point here you, you, you took on me. Um, I've spoken on this issue for the chamber a number of times, and one of the first things that I, I always make a point of saying, uh, the chamber is a strong advocate for a hard day's work equals a good day's pay. Um, but we look at the issue outside of the vacuum of a minimum wage, and we look at it in the context of everything that businesses are dealing with. Um, we had a $3 increase over the last three years in the minimum wage that businesses had to find a way to incorporate into their operating budget. Uh, we had paid sick days come online that they had to find a way to incorporate into their budget. We have ever-increasing energy costs in New England, uh, some of the highest in the country. We have increasing health care costs. 
And if the nurse staffing ratio question passes on the ballot, that's going to increase costs even further. You also have the paid family and medical leave potentially on the ballot, which would add another cost. Uh, not to mention one of my favorite topics, uh, property taxes. Um, <laughs> with Worcester having a significantly higher business tax rate than any of the surrounding communities in our region, uh, and that rate as well is tacked on to a lot of businesses a second time in a personal property tax that uh, residents and homeowners don't have to see. Uh, <coughs> Rep, you talked about you hear from constituents, you meet with constituents, uh, and I have to say I we do the same thing at the chamber. Uh, we just call them members, not constituents, uh, but we get some of the same calls on the opposite side. Um, it, not hearing of massive layoffs to your point, Ramon, not big catastrophic issues, but what's going to happen if that business was looking to add two or three employees? What happens for that business that's seasonal in their employment? Uh, I met a business uh, about a year ago talking about getting to the $11 minimum wage. He's a seasonal employer and he said to me, I normally would take on 12 or 15, usually high school, college kids in the summer. I've cut that back to 11. Now it's one business, but that is indicative of, of what some of them are dealing with. They're not seeing catastrophic layoffs, but it's stunting their ability to uh, ramp up, hire additional people, uh, or meet some of their, their traditional need. Uh, I do have to agree with you though, uh, Rep, we are happy there's at least a bill in the legislature to look at this. Um, I think that legislating through the ballot box uh, is always very problematic. Time and again, over the course of as many years as I've paid attention, you constantly see the legislature going back in and having to correct um, you know, paid, paid sick days. The legislature stepped back in. Um, we were discussing earlier the uh, the two marijuana ballot questions for medicinal and recreational. You've seen the legislature have to come and step in. Going through the legislative process as your bill uh, would requires compromise, requires the groups to sit down and, and figure out something that is, is palatable for everyone, which is what happened several years ago in the movement to the $11 wage, uh, whereas going to the ballot is a winner take all. You know, if, if I want to write a ballot question that says Representative Donahue has to wear a, a jester's hat every Thursday, <laughs> if I get enough signatures and I, I get enough votes, I, I get my, my way. But if that bill goes through the legislature, it, there's a, a requirement to compromise. There's a requirement to uh, find a, a path forward that is uh, palatable to as many as possible. But for the businesses, it, it provides some level of predictability. Uh, a lot of our members didn't necessarily like uh, the last increase to the $11, but it was in black and white. This year it's going to this. This year it's going to this. This year it's going to this. They can build out and forecast their budget. Um, so we're hoping uh, if this issue moves forward, that it does move forward uh, in a legislative manner instead of through the ballot. Great, thanks. Um, last question, Beth? If, if I could just add in, um, you know, at the Research Bureau, we tend to be hyper-localized. Uh, we look at this through the lens of Worcester and the surrounding communities. Uh, kind of recognizing that at kind of that macro level, yes, the minimum wage changes get absorbed and they, they kind of get returned into the economy, money starts flowing back to businesses through higher wages and uh, through higher prices. Uh, what happens in a city like Worcester that struggles to create economic opportunity, that, that you know, is working to rebuild uh, and faces the very real challenge of bringing new businesses in and as, as Mr. Lucemore mentioned, the kind of other factors involved in the cost structure. You know, does the potential of a higher minimum wage affect Worcester differently? Uh, or are there certain conditions that Worcester needs to take into account as it looks like it looks at a minimum wage increase? Um, well, I think um, one of the things that we've seen in, in Massachusetts since the $11 an hour um, increase, um, for example, the governor during a state of the state address brought up uh, New Bedford. A similar size gateway city in uh, Massachusetts that was one of the <clears throat> one of the, the cities during the eleven dollar an hour debate that would come up that was going to see over twenty five percent of their population have a direct increase in the minimum wage and 
now, you know, the governor just touted it in the state of the state address as being one of the fastest, uh, the lowest unemployment change um, in the country. Um, and you've seen a huge uh, change in, in the, the job growth there and also a huge drop in unemployment. Um, and I think if you look around the state, I think seven of the top ten uh, large fastest growing job markets are, are in Massachusetts. Um, and some of that comes around to the fact that I think that you, you do see that on a local level. That, you know, increasing that minimum wage locally in those different jobs does create an economic impact um, directly in some of these cities. Also, I mean, the, the minimum wage at a local level depends upon the prices of other things as well. Right? And, and what we've seen, I think, in the form of Jeremy Schultz in the graph like this, so I think three is, is a very interesting year, not just the extent to which productivity gains and wage gains divorce, but also the, the way in which the labor market and the housing market divorce. Mm -hmm. okay. Whereas, you know, um, at that point in time, the housing market and the labor market seem to have kind of a close dancing relationship. But at that point, you know, housing market simply skyrocketed in terms of, you know, elevating you know, and, and growing costs in, in, in a variety of ways. And the labor market doesn't, you know, doesn't follow, as economists say, pari passu with it. With, with the labor, um, with the housing market. Um, transportation costs also have grown immensely. Um, and it's increasingly more and more difficult as a result also of the you know, increases in, in the house, the price of housing that workers have to live farther away from work. Okay? So, so we're seeing a whole host of factors getting in there at the very local level contributing you know, to have that minimum wage Go further or not go further, right? Uh, in Worcester, we have been increasingly seeing that um, that larger numbers of workers from outside the city are coming to work into the city. That's an indication of that may be that is work more abundant in the city, or the wages are better in the city, or that actually, as it's seen in some sort of segments of the housing market that things in Worcester are getting more expensive also. Right? So workers have to live further out, you know, uh, from what the traditional concentration of jobs. It also has to change with the geography where jobs are. So, so there are a number of factors that interact with the minimum wage that makes it, you know, um, you know it's, it's ultimately, I think, you know, um, a I, I think a decision that, or, or makes it an issue that, you know, that comes down to you know, whether, whether or not we think that in, in society we should make an effort at spreading the wealth that is generated downwardly rather than upwardly. And I think, you know, that's that's the point ultimately. But I would just question talk about New Bedford. Certainly at the last one it was 25% of their employment base would be directly impacted. But the growth the governor's talking about, how much of that was outside of hourly earners and was growth and, and boom of salary workers. You know, and I, I I think to your point, Ramon, the it's not that it's expensive to live in the city or too expensive and workers are living outside. I, we hear constantly that we need more housing options. So it, it, I would argue that it's an issue of lack of, of options for some of those. And some people choose not to live in a city and choose to live just outside because it is so accessible and people are able to get into the city, go to their job, and then go back to a place that, that is in the city to, to live. Um, but I think the fact that people are coming into the city also speaks to there's a great economic uh, development and, and job growth in the city because we're continuing to attract those businesses and attract those jobs and, and bring them here, regardless of hourly or, or salary range. So I have a question uh, which I will throw to Stu. Um, you mentioned that the Chamber is a strong advocates for hard days work leading to a good day's pay. Um, you also listed a lot of challenges that businesses are facing um, outside uh, labor costs. So the question is, you can begin the answer and then you all can discuss, what can the state do to support industries that you know, disproportionately rely on low-wage workers? What can the state do to support those industries while also meeting 
the chambers and I think everyone's goal of a kind of high road labor market where people can make ends meet. What can, what can the state do to support those industries? Several years ago with the last minimum wage increase, the bill was, that bill was tied with some restructuring of uh, unemployment insurance to try and mitigate the increased costs of wages with decreased costs on the other side. Um, so working with the state, working with the stakeholders to try and push down some of those other costs that continue to rise up um, so that it offsets some of that increase. If the increase is going to happen, if you can kind of zero sum the bottom line, um, finding ways to make us less reliant on property taxes, again, one of my most favorite topics to talk about year round. If we can find a way to make that less of a, uh, a critical need for the city, find other revenue sources, other revenue generators, we can lower that. That mitigates some of those additional costs. Um, and, but some of it is also uh, high cost of energy is, is less you know, the state and a bit more regional and, and federal and I'm not trying to get into a pipeline discussion here, but you know the you know the issue of increased natural gas capacity, which would then you know be the bridge fuel to a, a renewable energy future, which hopefully will then help deflate some of the cost of energy. I mean, in New England energy costs are higher than anywhere else in the country, so some of that is government, some of it state government, some of it is is a little bit higher. Than that. State policy that can support low wage industries? Well, uh, we, we, have a, we have a small project in which we're supporting small restaurants. And these are mostly like, small restaurants. These are restaurants away from the radar screen of the conventional business resource networking interventions. So these are you know, restaurants that run on one to three people, with the family in the, in the kitchen. And uh, one of the observations that they all make is the high cost of doing business in Worcester. As far as you know, getting from City Hall the fast and correct and rapid you know, information they need in order to make quick decisions that have to deal with you know, small things and tinkering with things in their small operation. So it takes three months to get a reply you know, from the Office of Inspection and Services. Right. And after that, you know, uh, you got to do repeated iterations with them in order to get everybody in the same page the same day. There are four inspectors for, you know, 1,600 businesses in the city. You know, you're lucky if you get inspected. Right. So, um, so there are a number of things that I think from the standpoint of supporting those business operations, which we would expect would have to suffer more from this kind of increase, you know, that can in fact make their life you know, much easier and much cheaper. Right? Uh, working with them with regard to, for example, creating consortiums for you know, buying wholesale. Right? Uh, helping them to, you know, with finding you know, adequate contractors with, you know, that would just not take them for a ride. Many of these you know, small businesses are inexperienced businesses. You know, we've, we've had appraisals for one job that range between 40,000 and 12,000. Right? So I think there are a lot of different things that you can do in order to support you know, this small, small business, which you know, uh, seems to be is kind of increasingly the kind of business populating our, you know, our neighborhoods. You know, um, we did a very interesting layout. We took, um, we just created the, the the first interactive GIS platform with all the restaurants of the city, and we found that their patterns of concentration, you know, reveal some very interesting questions with respect to what could be a way in which the city can support small businesses in, you know, in neighborhoods that would have sort of you know, only more affluent, but that you know, would also um, increase the ability to you know, move business to those places and in fact just you know, have those businesses hire workers at better wages because they would have better income, better capacity to transfer those, you know, those, those gains into more affluent populations. 
right? So, so I, I think there, there are ways in which you could work in order to mitigate the impact of that sort of minimum wage, you know, increase. Also, you have to, you know, realize that many of these businesses work with family in the, in the kitchen, and family doesn't get paid minimum wage, right? So you definitely have to find other better ways of, of helping these businesses. So it's not the minimum wage what's hurting them. It's a, a different set of costs, some of them of the ones that you spoke about. Uh, but I think there is something that we could do in order to help these small businesses mitigate that impact. So cities can raise their own minimum wages by law, but there may be ways to cut the red tape to yeah. support small business development. That's good. Um, next question. We, um, oh, well, let me ask one more question, and we'll do the Q&A from the audience. So we often hear, uh, in response to the question, what can we do to raise wages, the answer comes back, education. Right? And it's true that the more education you have, uh, all things equal, the more you're going to earn. So my question is, uh, barring that response, what can we do to raise the standard of living for workers in these industries, given that we know that 55% are full-time, 90% are adults, a quarter are parents, et cetera, over half are women? What can we do to raise standards for workers in those industries that allow them to keep their jobs? What kind of policies and labor market institutions can we introduce that make these jobs family sustaining jobs? I'll start with Aaron, since so we can get to answer yeah. yeah, I think I think there's quite a bit. I mean, um, you know, the standard of living, you know, a lot of it is tied to, to the wages and access to education and, and all that too. But I think, you know, you know looking at, you know, another bill that we're working on at the State House too is looking at, at wage theft. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, particularly in low income, um, low income jobs and working class, you have a prevalence of wage theft. Uh, that I think is, is a major issue as far as, you know, you might be working those 40 hours, but you might not be making them wage. Um, there's been a, a kind of a lack of enforcement, I think, from the Attorney General's office and, and from the state and kind of processing uh, a lot of those, those issues. Um, you know, we're still we're still working on workplace issues, uh, workplace safety issues. Um, you know, we just just passed a, a actually for, for cities and towns a, an expansion of OSHA regulations because uh, not every worker is still covered by OSHA regulations and some of the safety codes. Uh, so ensuring that they have uh, they have those and, and also that we have we have well funded um, social service programs, uh, social safety net programs as well. Um, you know, you're still making that twenty three thousand dollars a year, and we still have you know issues with people being able to afford food. Um, and you know, we worked on programs such as the food trust and healthy incentives programs to bring in healthy food into these communities. Um, you know, you look at low income, low income families tend to have higher rates of obesity, high, they tend to have higher rates of smoking, they tend to have higher rates of, of negative health outcomes and, and trying to bring in programs that, that also allow them to kind of expand their dollars beyond what they're doing into you know, purchasing healthy food that maybe they can't accept access because they're living in a food desert and you know, their, their bus service has been cut, which we're facing, and now they don't have the options to, to get around. Um, I think there's a lot that you can look at as those kind of you know million different issues that are affecting a low-income person, particularly in the city of Worcester, living in a three-decker that you have to kind of attack from you know both outside of work, but also also inside on the job. We've seen also certain instances. I mean, take the food-driven economy. You know, we, we all we usually speak only about restaurants, but for example, take you know the the variety of institutional settings in which we we prepare food. And th this is very important for the city of Worcester because city, because Worcester lives out of education and health, and those two feed a lot of people, and they feed a lot of very fussy people. Right? So you need to, you know, shift. And I think they're reading the writing in the wall. You need to shift from the high turnover model to a stable, you know, model that maintains uh, workers uh, within. I think they're roster for longer periods of time because there is a high cost to turn over, especially in those industries where you are increasing the quality of the product that you're putting out. So you cannot just go out there and find fresh organic foods you know, that are going to be cooked in front of the customer, um, put it in the hands of an inexperienced low wage worker, which will, you know, overcook and bring down the broccoli to its molecular compositions. <laughs> you know, so that that is something that the institutional kitchens are realizing. And we've done a couple of very good experiments with the Worcester Public Schools. Right? So the way in which we increase the customer satisfaction within the school, you know, and the way in which we increase the subsidies is doing away with the bad restaurant model. That is you need to increase the capacity of people to feel good coming to eat in the system rather than to feel forced 
to eat in the system. The ones who are not eating in the systems, the ones you have to bring in to eat within the systems, are not the poor. It's a middle class. And in Worcester, it's very interesting because it's a blanket subsidy that applies to everybody. Right? So if you manage to bring in more people into the system, you will produce a subsidy. Right? But to do that, you need to increase the quality of the food. And to increase the quality of the food, you need to increase the training of the people. Right? And what is interesting is that in the last round of collective bargaining agreements, we had a conversation with the union in the context of agreeing to create fewer categories, increase the flexibility, and increase the, propensity, the probability that workers could move within those categories using training as an incentive, and as a result, also gain higher wages. And the model seems to be helping to increase the utilization rate across the and that is a very interesting way of thinking about how, within the context, some institutional rules can serve to improve the quality of work and improve the quality of the model as a whole. We have time for one quick follow-up on it. So uh, you're talking about the consumer experience. Uh, the state senate recently convened a panel looking at supporting local retailers. Um, I testified before the first hearing in that panel, kind of presenting a, a menu of options um, in ways that state could the state could support. Um, small retailers, but one of the other panelists was a professor, Zinette Tong, from MIT, and she does a lot of research on the high road uh, service economy, and she looks at this connection between um, workers who feel empowered, who feel happy, who are well paid, and she actually has um, a wealth of case studies from outside the country and from inside the country, from one of the Tulsa. So my question is for you, Stu, what are your members doing around, the, given that they face wage increases and that you said the economy is growing in the context of those wage increases, I wonder what your members are doing around the question of consumer experience um, through worker training and, and kind of developing workers to, to deliver the kind of uh, service and experience that, that Ramon's talking about. Well, part of it is, I, I, to the prior question, um, we constantly try and educate our members of what programs and incentives are out there for them to do training with their indigenous worker population yep. um, to continue to help those people skill up. Mm -hmm. um, but customer experience, uh, it's kind of interesting you bring that up. Within the chamber, we continually do seminar and education programs on a, a variety of, of topics. Um, given what I do, I'm more involved with ones that deal with, you know, changes to labor laws, changes to, you know, paid sick days, and a $15 minimum wage, <coughs> and, you know, what, what does that mean for for members, but one of our most popular and continually selling out seminar and education programs that we offer mm -hmm. is actually frontline customer service. Uh, it came from a small restaurant member um, having a conversation with one of the members of staff, actually with my boss, mm -hmm. um, and saying, "I pay my work and actually go and and get training on frontline customer service." Uh, and part of it is is helping educate the employee that they are the face of the person that signs the front of the check. You know, and, and when you walk in, when someone walks in, you're the face of that restaurant, that dry cleaner, that computer you know, repair shop. You're the front line, you're the face. Mm -hmm. And your interaction with that customer directly impacts their uh, experience and their image of your business, of your brand. Um, we have a conference room in our office that holds at capacity between 75 and 100, and we are constantly pulling wait lists when we run this frontline customer service. We've run it three or four times now over the last couple of years. Um, it is extremely popular with our, our members, and they're seeing a significant benefit out of it because it does get to your point. It, it helps their employee change their mindset so they're continuing to provide that enhanced customer experience. That's That customer leaves wanting to come back, not uh, to steal part of your analogy of, of school kids, not feeling forced to come back, but this is the only place I can go, but wanting to come back, wanting to go to that business, which then, um, you know, would spill over into increased revenues and then, you know, there's additional resources there if a, you know, employee is 
excelling that could potentially see a, a wage increase and, and you know, movement up in the internal ladder. Okay. Uh, oh, you already have the mic there. Yeah. Uh, thanks for, for holding this discussion it's, and for doing some research on this. I think it's a it's, it sounds like such a simple say, issue. Uh, uh, Jeff, right? Jeff Turgeon with the uh, Central Mass Workforce Investment Board. So when you talk about minimum wage, I mean, it sounds like such a simple issue, but then you start, when you, you know, the more you look into it, the more facets of it really kind of, kind of come to light. One of the things that, uh, you know, we're looking at the region setting a regional workforce development blueprint. And one of the issues that we're seeing is that uh, the effects of minimum wage increase uh, as it relates to the supply of labor and the competition for labor within industry groups. So maybe a bit counterintuitively, um, you know, as, as the minimum wage has risen, a lot of the supports for businesses that are tied to, uh, uh, you know, other external factors like, you know, in healthcare uh, reimbursement rates. So you've got a lot of long-term care facilities that had paid maybe a dollar or two more than minimum wage as a premium to, to recruit in CNAs and, and uh, home health aides and those kind of frontline jobs. And what's happened with the minimum wage increase, the, the reimbursement rates hasn't increased. So they've really been struggling to kind of fill that labor because uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of what we're finding is, all things being equal, the supply of labor, people would make a choice not to invest in education uh, or further training for themselves in the time lost and, and the hassle of going through training when they can get a job maybe in retail that doesn't that doesn't require them to do that. So the, you know, the classic example is, hey, the person that's working at, at a fast food restaurant was that person that would decide, I'll go do the training for three months and then get a job in the healthcare field for that frontline delivery because they'd, they'd prefer a job in healthcare. But getting them to make that leap and to, and to take the time off from work or to do the extra effort to get through that training doesn't necessarily happen because they're getting paid just as much now, you know, in that retail job. So there's, there's more that, competition. What's your question? I mean, I think I, the question's implicit to me, but what's your question? Uh, it, it's not, it's more just a, 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 a rant. If you will. <laughs> no, it's just, it's just there, there's just a lot more different facets to this. I guess one thing, one question would be, has anyone looked at how this impacts things like reimbursement rates and whether that needs to change. So I, I think to broaden the question, uh, there are a number of low wage industries, including some nursing homes, a very obvious example, most nursing home patients are on Medicaid, which is a state federal partnership. Uh, social and human services, right? Contracts through the Department of uh, Health and Human Services, DCF, DMH. A lot of those private employers will be affected by minimum wage increases, right? But is the state money going to follow? Yeah, the tough one is that you do have to look at that, and you know, I've seen even from private employers uh, that I've talked to about the issue is that yeah, you know, I've, I've talked to some owners of Dunkin' Donuts that are having issues filling their jobs at fifteen dollars an hour currently because people are like, well, I don't want to be on my feet all day, or can pick and choose because the, the labor market has been so so competitive in, in some some of those regards. Um, but I think you know. One of the things is looking at you know at the federal level. I think you know some a lot of these reimbursement rates they need to go up, and also the federal minimum wage needs to go up. I think yeah, we're still sitting at what seven twenty five right now uh, for the federal minimum wage. So having that conversation on the macro level and on the national level is, is a huge point. Um, you know, and the other problem too is I think you know as we look at some of these changes and even some of the policies that we were talking about on the state level to, to support businesses or to push businesses forward. Well, a lot of that also takes state money and state revenue. And one of the other ballot questions that we're facing as well that we haven't talked was is also the cut of the retail associations uh, ballot questions to, to cut the sales tax from 6.5 all the way down to 5 percent, which we can see you know hundreds of millions of dollars of lost revenue uh, from that too. So it's kind of you know balancing both of those concerns together on how how can we how can we fix some of these reimbursement rates of whatever's in the state's control, but also you know maintain you know a healthy labor market. I mean, there, there are a variety of important internal labor market aspects, the way in which the systems are, are, are constructed. So every time that there has been a minimum wage change in the state of New York, the health care legislation has all gone and recategorized the, 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 the characteristics of low-wage workers that are supposed to be working in certain categories, such as nurse, 
health home aids. So in that way, they sometimes also create mechanisms. Well, so it's very specific to the industries and even to the sub-segments of the industry. Because you're talking the healthcare, it's very difficult, very different to talk about hospitals, to long-term care, to ambulatory, and the patterns that emerge as a way by way of employers adapting to other kinds of drivers that include technology, reimbursement rates, you know, imposition of HMO characteristics into certain parts of the healthcare industry. So the breakdown, you have to slice it and dice it by sector, by types of establishments. There, yeah. There's no one simple answer. Yeah, when we look at it in the mass budget, we look at largely nursing homes, uh, state contracted human services, and child care providers. Yeah. Um, yeah. You name it or your Good morning. My name is Matt Wally, I'm a city councilor here in Worcester. I just want to thank the panel. My question is to Representative Donahue, and I'm just curious as to the factors that went into the four-year goal of $15 per hour. Looking at the slide earlier, we know that in the city of New York, they had the fight for 15. I think that was driven by the fast food restaurant. Um, I think one could make the argument that the cost of living is, in New York is a lot higher than mass, or should mass be lower? On the other hand, one could make the argument that even in mass, $15 an hour, depending upon where you are, wouldn't go towards allowing you to afford a single uh, apartment. So just curious, what were the factors that went into the $15 per hour specifically? Yeah, yeah so, so $15 an hour, I mean, one of the reasons a lot of people ask, like, you know, why is it just because it racked with fight, I think what someone, someone <laughs> said to me. Uh, you know, the idea to get to $15, um, is to get to really what we saw as the you know the 1973 numbers if you adjust it for inflation, getting back to the, that that healthy minimum wage that we had seen up until to that point. So you had that that great great divide. Um, you know, New York, other cities have done it. Um, other states are on their way to getting to, to $15 an hour, but uh, in Massachusetts, we don't have the ability to set a municipal. Um, we, we don't we don't set the, the minimum wage at the municipal municipal level as we talked about earlier. Formal petition. It's a much much more complicated process. And historically, we've always gone through a statewide uh, minimum wage increase. So, and if you look at Massachusetts, yeah, the other differences in the cost of living from Pittsfield or a small town in the Berkshires to, to downtown Boston, absolutely, there, there can be major differences right there. But really, through the legislation that we have and the legislative process we have, we have to do it at, at, at a statewide level. I think it's probably the most effective and easiest way to do it. And then fifteen dollars again, it's, it's based upon you know that one dollar a year uh, cost to make sure that you know. And again, this is. The bill, the bill in the ballot question called for four years. That stuff's up for grabs on the table as far as the conversation that we have. Do you split that up to six years? Do you shorten it? However, that ends up coming out. You know, there's there's different ways to have those conversations. And again, one of the reasons why we should be looking at a legislative solution, not not going just going to the ballot. So short. You're going to change that timeline. I know. <laughs> I don't yeah. you. Maybe, maybe stretch it. Maybe stretch it out a little bit. <laughs> Hi, Chris O'Keefe, Greater Worcester Community Foundation. Thank you for, uh, for coming out this morning. Can you talk about how the minimum wage increase affects what they call the cliff effect? Hmm. Uh, where you read in some places that to get a raise from eleven thousand from eleven dollars an hour to thirteen dollars an hour, fourteen dollars an hour really isn't a raise when you account for all the support you can lose. But you're really losing money until you get to twenty dollars an hour. So how does the fifteen dollar an hour wage play in uh, what they call the cliff effect? Of State benefits and support for child care, health care, et cetera. Does, on does on. everyone understand what the cliff effect is? If you don't, feel free to raise your hand. Okay. I did not Sure. <laughs> so the cliff effect is basically there are a number of state benefit programs, I mean, federal benefit programs as well, but we can call state programs. A number of state programs for which, as Chris mentioned, uh, you know you can be eligible at the current minimum wage, but as your minimum wage goes up, you might lose the benefit entirely, or uh, some share of the benefit would go away, such that. If you had previously been counting that benefit as part of your total income, you might lose so much of it that even with the increase in your wage income, on the whole, you're left worse off. You might lose the child care benefit entirely. You might lose the public housing benefit entirely. You might lose uh, SNAP as federal. Um, but there are other uh, Medicaid's uh, federal and, and, and state. So there are a number of these benefits. I will just say before our panelists respond, and I want them to, we at Mass Budget have taken on um, a project to look as comprehensively as we can as child care benefit, the ITC, um, housing and health care, to look at the cliff effect of this minimum wage uh, increase because it comes up a lot. And we certainly don't want to run into that wall, um, you know, suddenly starting January 1st, 2019. But now I'll turn it over to the panel to do it there. So. Well, um, 
we just start by saying that let's just not assume that everybody who's unemployed needs to be employed. That is, there are some people who are justifiably so not in the labor force because they can be in the labor force for a variety of reasons. So whether or not the minimum wage will serve as a, you know, as a driver to you know, create incentives for people to get a job, those ones who are employable, um, I think, again, you need to look at it by sector and the way in which you may want to sort of, you know, think about, you know, who are those people you're trying to, to bring out. So when there's a downturn in the economy, we know there is competition between retail, fast foods, and the low end of the labor market in healthcare, nurse aides, right? So now with the downturn in retail, retail and the restructuring of retail, uh, you know, into more mechanization and massive layoffs, we've seen increases in the numbers of people who are thinking about moving into nurse aides. Now, um, as things just stand, that it means if you are an employer that values little training, right? Um, you will be trying to, you know, you'll be trying to attract people from that segment of, of, of the labor market. Now, you know, will you be willing to and help the people and will organization help those employers who might be interested in bringing people into employment by, for example, subsidizing training, right? So by increasing the training, increasing the skill, you might be able also to increase what you get out of that person who's moving from sort of, you know, unemployment into employment facing a potential cliff effect. The people might be able to take the chance because they also see long-term prospects with respect to fitting into a ladder in some sector that has some promise to move within one or two years out of that job. See what, what, I, what I mean? It's not just simply the prospect of what you will lose now, but the prospect of what you may gain in one and one and a half year after just picking up that job. And I think that's very important to convey to a worker. All right? You might be facing the cliff effect, but if you take this training, and you work within the you know, boundaries of this training, what you are bound to get in returns in the second or third year as a result of your also potential for mobility may change your, your perspective. So you might be willing to accept a little bit of the, of the cliff effect. I was thinking more of the employed CNA who's turning down a raise because it would cost you too much um, in terms of yourself. I mean, I worked in, I, I, it's difficult because it's, this is data that we don't have. So we're talking very much out of internal experience. I work with 11 health, 1199 Healthcare SEIU in, in New York City, you know, precisely assessing those, those kinds of questions. At what point you know, we can create a platform of motivation for a worker who is you know, able to work, to face the cliff effect, take the plunge, Right, and also uh, be able to sort of you know, understand that there is a ladder um, which might be sort of waiting, and once you get the training, you can move into that ladder. There's some of those jobs, but there are others that are not. You know, depending on what you're a CNA, because if you're a CNA in a nursing homes, in the nursing home scale, you know, and very pretty flat, so there's not mobility. So I think it depends upon how you understand the human resource management regime and what kinds of you know, things you can introduce into equation of moving in or out of, of employment and what can that worker perceive might be elements for long-term progress. And, and, and I, so I think it's, it, it depends upon, at, at that point, I think labor market intermediaries fulfill a very important function, kind of working the, the details of the relationship between the employer and the employees, um, helping them understand what are opportunities for training. What are, so for example, CNAs, Visiting, you know, nurse aides working for, you know, um, some of the contractors in New York. Um, sometimes the problem is not wage. Sometimes the issue is to have a regular <laughs> schedule that allows you to get clients all in the Bronx, not one in the Bronx and one in Queens. So have your wage goes away in transportation. So there are a number of very important parts of that discussion um, that I think modulate the, the idea of, you know, you're either suffering or not suffering, or will suffer or not suffer from the cliff effect. I don't know if that makes sense. I think some of that can also be addressed in the, the details of the legislation of, of how the increase is rolled out. Um, you know, 
maybe it's it's a, a mitigating factor to maybe extend that from four years to you said six, so I'll, I'll use your random six number, extending that out. But it's also making sure it's it's a, a collaborative effect or, or collaboration with some of the service agencies and the service providers of some of those programs and helping them educate their client base of, you know, you are moving, and some of it is, is Ramon's point, you're moving in this direction. Yes, you're going to have this period where it's a difficult adjustment, but, you know, does your employer offer, you know, some of the training that I mentioned before, and on the job training, or a, um, you know, a training program that will skill the employee up to then see an increase in, in wages and move from that kind of a cliff area and beyond. I, I think some of that is, is, is yeah. kind of built into the more holistic approach to, to all of it to make sure that you know, the people working with some of these individuals are, are helping them uh, and educating them of, of what they're going to face and, and some of it I think would potentially mitigate how the uh, wage is, is rolled out. Uh, and I say mitigate, assuming it's going to extend the time period, not, uh, <laughs> not drop it to, oh, we can go to 15 next year. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and just a quick comment. And, and also, I think work with employers to help them understand that you know, it may pay off to help some workers overcome that cliff effect by offering a variety of you know, supplementary you know, help or other services that workers need, like, for example, jail care and so on. And, you know, understanding that there's some things that we do in society. So, you know, the, the gains in productivity over the implementation of the American Disability Act are, are really not greatly measured in the economy as a whole. But they're very important measure as a whole in terms of the citizenship opportunities we created where a vast amount of people in the population who would feel empowered and who would feel better citizens just because the fact they're included in the social contract. Yeah. And I think those things are quite important when we, when we, when we ponder these, these kinds of things. It's just not an issue of cost and opportunities. It's, it's, there is a great deal of you know, issues of you know, social dignity and so on that are very important when we're able to create conditions for somebody to be employed. Overall, people like to be employed, not unemployed. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, we have time for one uh, last uh, quick question, if anybody wants to get one. Hearing none, uh, do you want to close us up? Sure. Uh, just uh, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, thank you to our panel and to our moderator. Uh, it's a critical issue. It's, gonna, it's an issue that will have broad effect on Worcester, on the state as a whole. Good luck, Representative Donahue, with the discussions. I'm sure you'll have some interesting ones going forward. Um, but thank you all for being out, and thank you for coming out to, to participate.